take in your seats. Acts chapter 1. We'll just leave it sit on that because I'm going to actually go back over uh, some of the parts of this series and then we'll jump into Acts chapter 1. Yeah. All right. Well, we know we're awake, live, and we're ready to learn, right? Amen? Okay. I don't have to do aerobics to get everybody in, you know. But, <laughs> but I do, um, I want to go over just a few things that we have talked about because this is the last of this part of the series on fear. Um, this is my last part on it for now. And, uh, and then next week, Vern will be preaching and, and we'll go on to the other things that God has for us. But we've been assigned to um, address fear within ourselves. Amen. And we stood up and I recorded it, actually, because I'm that person who keeps track of prophecies and prayers and things like that. So I recorded it on my phone the Sunday that we all stood up and we renounced fear. And we said, get out. We're done. We're going to address you, right? And, and so sometimes when, when, you know, just as a proof of why we need to record things, some of you are going, we did? You were there, I saw you. And um, so we all stood and we did that. And, um, and so we need to remind ourselves when you pray, you put something into motion. And so then we're gonna back it up with the action, right? And so when we said we wanna address that, when we go to address it, that demands change. That means it, it's not like we're just talking around it and keep looking at it for the rest of our life. It's like, actually, you're moving out, fear. And belief is coming alive and any doubt has got to leave. And so we've been addressing it kind of from that. But we've also been looking at how the brain works. Because you need to understand how you operate. It's the things that you understand you can handle, the things you don't understand that drive you crazy. So we have the jail set up here. For those of you who have, weren't a part of that, you can go on the, online and look at those services um, where we had a jail set up here. And I talked about uh, the building of the brain and the clusters that can cluster in the brain and how a lie will build around a trauma. And, and from that lie that's, that's there, there'll be strands of memories that support that that kind of put you in prison. And we talked about that. We talked about um, shame and fear and pride and how they go together as the goat's head. Um, you can find that uh, on the first couple sermons on fear. And, um, and then we went and talked about uh, how we're to um, deal with our arrestments, you know, the child within, or when we're inside of our thought and we're ex experiencing something. We're not on the outside of it addressing it. We're literally inside of it reliving it. And um, that can cause a lot of fear. And, and we also addressed the um, interrogation. Remember that sermon? For those of you who are here, we interrogate our own thoughts. We question. When we're inside the thought, it's interrogating us, and we feel like we're in that prison and we can't get out of the thought. And it'll make the thought now instead of, you know, maybe... 10 years ago, it's happening right now and we can't get out of that thought. Um, when you interrogate it, you put yourself outside of the thought, looking into it and saying, hey, I need to know where you came from. I need to know what the root of this is. I need to know why this is so important. What was the trauma? You know, what age do I feel like? We, we interrogate our thoughts. So that's part of attacking um, fear itself. And, um, and then we talked about the keys to the kingdom last week. Uh, having those keys and actually um, the confusion that is in the body of Christ that causes fears is the things that we own or we have many times we're not operating in, but we're saying that they work and we're not seeing results. That'll cause fear. That causes fear in our children. They're afraid like, should we believe in this? Because I'm not really seeing too many people get healed. I'm really not seeing too much action take place in these certain things or whatever. I'm not really seeing what the church is presenting. I know it says it, but where is it? Right? And so um, we can have the keys to the kingdom, which we do. But if we're not knowing how to put it in the right lock, we don't know where the lock is. We don't know how to identify things. We don't know which key goes where. We're not going to get free. And yet we have the keys. We also have the authority. He's given us, he's authorized to it. Who, who did? The author, who is God. Authorized the authority to us to tread upon scorpions and serpents and over all the power of the enemy. We have the authority. 
well, we have all the authority here and we have the keys. What is going on? What's going on with our life? Why isn't this working? And so when we don't address those questions, all it does is build fear in religion. See, religion is a man-made thing. It's very, very fear-based, right? The more rules you make, the more it seems like you can understand it. You know, it's all about the rules and following the rules and wearing your hair a certain way and talking a certain way and acting a certain way. Um, and if you stay in that zone and we're in that zone, well, then there's got to be something that's got to work. And if it doesn't work, which it doesn't, then what do we say? Well, you didn't follow the rules. See, you're not doing good enough. You're not enough for God. Look at that. You should do better. You should do better. And see, it puts us on us, and then we're afraid that we're never going to reach that mark. And some of us were raised in households where you'll get loved, you'll get the promise, you'll get the thing if you do this and this and this. Well, you did this and this and this, and you hit that mark, and they moved it. Right? And you're like, well, what did I work so hard for? Well, you do it again, and then they move it. Um, and so then if you get that feeling about God, if you get that feeling about church, you're going to be scared of church. You're going to be scared of commitment. You're going to be scared to get involved. You're going to be scared to believe because you're already of the belief system like, mm, when I put effort into something, they always move the mark. I'm not enough. I'm inadequate. I'm flawed. And I'm probably, for some people, just really not lovable enough for him to do something. And so it creates a misbelief in us, and then we form a religion around that that says, well, as long as we're trying really hard, you know, you never know, and, and we are really push to that. It keeps us in a spot where we're under law then, and yet he came to set us free from law, Amen. right? Yeah. We're not under law. We're under grace. Yeah. Under grace. Grace is what convicts us of sin. Grace is what lets us know we're loved. Grace shows us how, um, how he has conquered for us. Grace says to us, I have all of this for you. Come to me. Grace says, I'm open-armed to you. Uh, come on. Come as you are. That's what grace says. But religion says, well, why, hold on a second. You can't just get to him like that. You've got you to do the rules. You've got to do what I've done. Because usually somebody sets their self up as the I've done. It's usually that they'll say it's from the Bible, but it's usually, well, what we believe here, right? It's, and, and they'll throw some word at it. But it's really somebody has set themselves up as a standard that says, look at what I have done. And so do as I have done, and you'll, you'll get what I have. And a lot of times you look at that, and you're like, I really don't want what you have. <laughs> right? There's a lot of young people, and they're not saying a whole lot, but they're like, I don't want that. So you keep going ahead and doing what you got going, your thing that you've done. I'll go do something else. That's what's happening to the church. And it's all fear-based. <coughs> it's a fear-based thing. It's a fear-based religion. It's religiosity. You look up the word religion in the dictionary, one of the meanings means to go back to bondage. So <laughs> what are we doing? Right? So um, I want to take you... Uh, through one more step, and, um, and then we'll take you through some steps of healing. But I want to show you a picture. Um, uh, I didn't want to bring the item this morning, but I wanted to just, I thought I'll just take a picture and show it to you. And it's, it is, um, it's about this big. Plus, if I brought it, you have to really squint to see it, right? And it's very detailed. You'll see that it is the, the picture of uh, Jesus in the manger, and it's carved out of wood. And I brought this to church a few times, you know, years ago. But this was given to me by Frederica Hayes. And I'm sure she's gone home to be with the Lord a long time ago already because we were living in Colorado when she gave this to me. And, I, and she was in her 80s. And she was a survivor of the Holocaust. And um, in that, she, um, she carved that, right? She had many carvings like that. And what I want to show you this morning is that our deepest place of pain where we can feel the most fear we can also switch that to a place of creativity so this you know jehovah is the god of covenant so we have this covenant with us with, with our god and he is the god who create he's the creative god who creates a way out of anything right 
And so we have that creative part built into us because we have been created in his image. And what they have shown uh, with knowing about the brain, because we're getting to know ourselves, just how we function, right? This is all, all psychological. We're not going by psychology book, but we're just learning about, hey, how do we operate? And how does God operate through how we operate? And so um, she was at a place, uh, what they're proving, I'll go back to what I was saying. Um, what they're proving is in that place where we go to the deepest part of our fear, where it feels like we can't fear any more than we're fearing at this moment, there's a valve inside our, our brain. There's a place inside of that's like, it's a saving grace that God has given us that will cause us, uh, if we tap into it, to go into creativity. Now, you would think it would limit you like crazy, but it's, it's people taking something positive to make a way out even if it's just within yourself. She made a way out and tapped a gift within her during the Holocaust. Um, they took her appendix out at 12 years old without anesthesia, just for fun, right? She walked into, uh, when, they, when they laid her down, she was also looking up at people hanging, you know, from the meat cleaver kind of stuff. And, and uh, just, just horrible, horrible images. And she was wasting away to hardly anything. And um, God made a way for her to, to be set free. But in the process, she found small sticks. She found um, things that, that her creative side, that faith side within her said, I'm at the place of hell itself, but I'm still going to do something positive. I'm still going to express how I feel. I'm still going to express who my Savior is. I'm still going to make a statement. And she had the wherewithal to just start using sharp stones and things like that to, um, you know, carve things. And she did carve um, some horses and some things that were pretty intricate as a kid and gave those to other children before they, so they could hold on to them when they went to the gas chambers and things like that. So it was really intense. So even as a kid going through everything that she went through, the horribleness of it all is she had to choose. You, you come to the end of yourself. And when you come to the end of yourself, maybe we don't go through something that intense, but we feel like we're at the end of ourself. There is a decision maker in the brain that says we can accept this and this really is the end, or I don't accept this and I will create a way out. I will do what I can do with what's in front of me and what I have, right? So she had nothing. So you look around, you dig for a rock, you, you dig for different things, and you, you know, she didn't even know she had that gift. That's what she told me. She said, I didn't know. She said, but I saw a little girl crying, and I needed comfort myself, and I just started working on wood, and it started to take a shape. There was an anointing that came on her, and the gift came up. And that's perfect, right? It's perfect. So detailed. And if you saw how small it is, like even the eyes and everything are just all, you know, done. And she, and I know she was elderly and she really wanted to uh, leave something with me. And it just means a lot to me that, you know, that came from somebody who was at the end of her life at one time, Right? She was at the end of all options. She was at the end. And in that moment, what they've proven is um, wherever you think your end is when you're to the end of yourself, you only have those two choices. Now, flight, fight, or freeze will try to give you other options. But the trueness of it is you either implode on yourself or you'll say there's got to be something. There has to be more. There has to be more. And some of you are sitting here feeling like you're at the end of yourself, you know, in finances or some other thing, right? And, um, and, and, and I want to acknowledge that's what it feels like that you're at the end of yourself. This could be your most creative moment. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Amen. Because when we have everything many times, yeah. the creative side of us is not in operation. When we're being, you know, we're filled our house with electronics and we're, you know, looking at TV and looking at all these different things. It's telling us, here, I'll take care of what you're going to think. I'll take care of that for you. You don't have to take care of that. 
But you know, when she's at a place, there's no TV, there's no food, there's no nothing. Your basic needs weren't even being taken care of. You're suffering, and yet this little girl made a way to do something positive, wow. right? And it helped her survive yeah. because she, once she found the gift within her, she said to herself, well, there's, they can take my life, they can saw my leg off, but they can't take the knowledge that I have about my God and the gift that I have. Yeah. You can't take that, right? And so uh, she had a studio and left some remarkable pieces, I'm sure, behind. Like I said, I'm sure she's gone home to be with the Lord uh, a while back. I just wanted to, to show you that because through all the stuff about talking about fear, when you really face your fear, really take it head on, whatever the thing is happening presently, or if it's happening presently and now it's mixed with everything else you haven't dealt with, and it culminates and it comes forward and you really are sitting there going, I ran out of my options. I'm at the end of myself. Christ in you, the hope of glory, will show his self strong in those moments as you yield. Yes. Amen. Right? Sometimes it's sad, but he does not get the say-so or uh, the ability to show himself strong when we're strong. Now, he doesn't take sickness, disease, and murder and all those and say, I'm going to use those so that I can bring people to the end of themselves. No, we live in a wicked world. It's wicked, and we're going to go through this world, and it, there is trouble, right? But take heart, I have overcome the world, right? So he's saying this to us. Um, to say, this is going to go down one way or another. So we either choose to let him show himself strong through us and in us, or we implode on ourselves and call the limit limited. And really, that word is the word damn. The word damn means to put a limit. That's why it's dangerous to say damn you, right? Because we're calling that over someone and we're saying, I want you limited. Then when you add God to that word, wow. You're like, there's nobody higher than him. Let's help out the limit be as strong as it possibly can. That's how dangerous these words are, right? And, and so when you come to the end of yourself, it's, it find it interesting. The flesh part of you might want to cry out something like GD, right? Or damn something, which makes no sense because you're feeling your limit, which is a damn to begin with. And we'll cry out that. Instead of looking and saying, where is the creative way out? I am a son or a daughter of the living God. I am created in his image. And so to see who I am in his image says, there's a way where there seems to be no way. Amen. I can make it better. Yeah, but it, she didn't get out of you know, her suffering. She wasn't completely out of the suffering. She didn't get out of all the things that happened to her. They still took her appendix. So she must not have created a way out. She made good of what was going on in the situation. That's our job is to look for what we can use our faith on and do that thing. Sometimes for people who are suffering in their body, it's just to be able to put their shoes on and take a shower. You know, not with your shoes on, but, you know, those two things, right? It's like, I took a shower today. It can be amazing. Or tying your shoes can be amazing that, you know, if you were suffering in your body. And we don't look at those things as victories many times. We'll look at that like, yeah, but it's still not what it should be. Take the victory yeah. in the moment, yeah. right? And do the next moment, like we talked about last Sunday, with a victory. Yeah. Do the next thing. So I wanted to show you that, and then I'll go through this, the steps um, just to remind you of some of the things we've talked about. I wrote down 10 steps. There's many more, but you know why over, overdo the brain? We've got to work on the first 10, right? So the first step when fear is triggered is getting a hold of your emotions and de-escalating yourself. The first step to grabbing a hold of fear is acknowledging that you've gone too far in emotion, right? And this is what I mean by it. You know, something can, can happen where you're like, oh, I have a fear of abandonment. Well, that's not a uh, fear necessarily out of control. You're recognizing it and it's there. But when it's escalated you where you can't think straight, then it doesn't pay to problem solve till you de-escalate. Yeah. 
And anger is a secondary emotion. We talked about how, um, you know, in that first emotion, you might feel really hurt, and that's what's causing you to be angry. Well, wherever you're hurt, there's fear. Wherever you uh, have abandonment, there's fear. Wherever there is shame, there's fear. Any emotions that you're going to feel that are negative, there's going to be fear at the base because that's how the devil planted sin to begin with. The, the sin is built at the core of, it's fear is at the core of it. And so anything that is touches that's caused a negative will have a base or a seed of fear in it. And so when something's happening in the now, when that seed of fear has touched us in the past, it will say, shall I grow? And in the moment, you can go up into letting it grow and just taking over and you can't control yourself. And, you know, and, and then people will come along and want to help problem solve that, you know, and they'll give you more to do. At that moment, the only thing you need to do is concentrate on de-escalating. We have to come to a point where we're not being driven by it in the moment. What we do in that moment, though, when we're really escalated, is we'll say, just say something to me to solve it. I just needed to quit right now. Well, no, you need, you need to be working on de-escalating your emotions right now. You're not going to solve it right at this moment until you bring that down. Even the, the cortisol and the adrenaline that's in your system won't allow you to. You're going to be in fight, flight, or freeze because of that. So you've got to give yourself time. You've got to do crazy stuff like go for a walk. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Breathe. <sighs> Talk slower. Force yourself to talk slower. See how it feels different when I do that? Even in your processor, in your computer, I'm talking slower to you. Talk quieter. Because if you go with fear, it will go in your processor and light up all your, your neurons and it'll light up your emotional state and your expressions will come out at full bore, right? It'll be full tilt. And then now you've lit up everything and how do you get that back? So one of the skills we have to have when it comes to fear is um, not fearing fear itself. Yep. Like I am experiencing fear right now. Okay, I'm not going to wig out. No. That's my first skill I got to have. I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, I, I'm not denying the fear. I'm not saying it's not there. I'm not denying the pain that caused the fear. But what I am saying is you don't own me. So you're not going to dictate what's going to happen right now. I'm going to slow everything down. You ever notice if, if you've ever been in a, in a spot where, you know, maybe someone was in a car accident, you met them at the hospital, they're either walking around in shock, you know, their loved ones in the, in the ER, they don't know what's going to happen. The, the people are walking around in shock, saying nothing because they can't talk. They're already just gone in it. Um, and or it's a pacing and it's fast and loud and we don't know we don't know what's gonna happen and you got to call grandma and you got the first thing if you're ministering in a situation like that is not to solve world peace the first thing is to help them de-escalate okay I hear you I hear you we'll, we will call grandma we'll let everybody know but I need you to come over here why don't you walk with me right now let's get calm right you know, and I'm not, I'm, you don't say it to them in a way like, well, this is no big deal. You should be over it. No, it's, I recognize, I hear you. You say things like that. You give good eye contact. Come. And you talk quiet. When they're talking like this, you don't meet a person at that. And we've talked a little bit about that. Because the first step is to de-escalate. De um, you're de-escalating the feelings. The second step is identify fear, pride, and shame. So when it's coming up in you and it wants to control you, you're literally saying, where did this come from? Am I feeling shame right now? Am I ashamed of something? Am I fearing that I'll be shamed again? Is that why the statement that someone made to me seems so big, it's bigger than life? I mean, identify it, interrogate it, get at it. And, um, and as you're de-escalating, then you're able to think that. And so you're dealing with, you know, is this my pride? Is this my ego? Is this my alter ego, which we're, we are not going to talk about in this, but I will be preaching on that. Um, is this that part of me that, you know, I got to identify? Uh, where is this coming from? And there's power in getting at the root of something. And you go, ah, okay, this is when I was shamed when I was little, and now they said this to me, and I'm freaking out right now, so I'm just going to take this down. We're going to work through this. God's got this. I'm okay. 
and you began to give yourself permission to do the math problem, right? But when fear, when you're not de-escalated in fear and you're not identifying things, you're not looking at it like a math problem, and that's how the brain fixes things, like a math problem. Two plus two should equal something. Somebody tells you it's five, you're like, I don't, I'm not buying that. <clears throat> Something's not right. At the same time, there's a piece that comes, even if you don't like the answer four, when you hit that two plus two is four, you go, I see it. I see it. That's something we can work with. We're going to work the problem. We're going to go through that. The third step is to allow for change. Allow for change means you have to have permission for change. You have to have permission to sit somewhere different. You have to give yourself permission to take a day off of work. You have to give yourself per permission to walk through something, to talk about something, to be okay enough. You have to have permission. And if you can't believe yourself giving yourself permission, you better ask somebody, can you give me permission to heal? I need permission to deal. I need permission to reveal. You know, we need that, we need that permission. That's all part of disarming fear. Number four is determined maturity. Determined maturity is not like, you know, what the scripture says, be you perfect as my Father in heaven is perfect. We know that the word perfect there means mature or mature love, cast out all, or perfect love. Those are the same thing. Cast out all fear. That, that's not like, yeah, I got to do that. I got to do that. And I'm determined I got to do that. No, you're actually holding your arrestment, your childlike side in, in a, a way of like, you're not staying five years old in this area. It's different than talking around it. It's different than like, I know, I need to mature. No, it's actually, actually, we're going to mature right now. Yeah. We're going to grow at this moment. We're going to persevere at this moment. I'm going to grab a hold of these thoughts right now, yeah. right? Um, but what will happen is we'll, you know, wig out. We'll, we'll do something. We'll go through the high emotions. We'll come down and be like, yeah, I know, I need to mature. And then we feel like we're maturing. No, you have to set your mind according to Romans 8. Set your mind means you grab a hold of the thought and you say, this is what we're doing and we're doing it right now. What can I do in this moment to mature? Maybe it's express your emotions that you, you should have been talking about a long time ago. Maybe it's to, to be able to study on something. Maybe it is to ask for help. These are all things you put pressure on it to say, I'm actually going to mature in this. I'm determined. I have a determined maturity going on. I've already determined this is what we're doing. I'm not staying this way. I am not going to let someone push that button. And every time they push it, I wig out. Uh, you know, someone will call it a trigger. Every time they pull the trigger, the gun goes off. Well, the gun's not loaded. It doesn't matter. So what we're doing is saying, there ain't no ammo. I'm getting the ammo gone. I will burn it, throw it out, do whatever I got to. But you're, it, I'm taking the power of this thing away. It's controlling my life. See it? Yeah. So it's a de determined maturity. Number five is interrogate your thoughts, which we talked a little bit about. You've got to be brave enough to face you. Yeah. You know, sometimes we'll take ourselves to a counselor and be like, talk to her, you know, and, and, and really we need that. We need that sometimes You get a counselor to be able to do that, but you go home with you and you still got to be fa brave enough to face you. You still got to be the one to tell you what you're going to do. And we're not victims uh, and we're not bullies. We talked about that. So we are, we are that person that's right there in the middle that says, I have a determined uh, maturity going on and I will interrogate these thoughts until we get to the bottom of this yeah. we're gonna find out what's really going on we acknowledge the arrestment because usually when you get to the bottom of it that's the next one when you acknowledge the arrestment you're getting to the bottom of something that you uh, were hurt in and that you're usually younger than your age group I'm 55 but if I get to the bottom of something I doubt that it's my 55 year old self that's freaking out Probably my eight-year-old self, where I got wounded, or some area like that, or I still feel like a freshman in high school in that area. I didn't get to mature that thing. And so that is actually the thing that, that will be the torment. So I'm getting to the bottom of that, and I acknowledge, I see that you're younger than where you should be. But remember, I have a determined maturity. So now you have to come with me, younger self. We're actually going to grow. Amen. See? And it's a positive thing. So number seven is welcome healing, but demand change. 
So you say to the arrestment inside of you, wow, you are younger than who I am. I'm 55. You're six. This thought pattern that's going through me is like eight years old or whatever it is. And so I acknowledge that that part of me needs to be healed. And I let that part of me know, it's okay, you're about to mature. God's got you. Here's what he says about you. You're favored. See, I'm talking to myself. At the same time, I'm, a, I'm welcoming healing, but then the part of me that's my most mature self demands change. Those two have to go together. What happens sometimes um, is we'll get a revelation that we need to welcome healing, and churches will get stuck on that. We're welcoming it. We're just welcoming. We're just going through seasons of seasons of seasons of welcoming this healing. And when does the healing complete? When are we finishing this healing? I don't know. We're still in the welcoming stage 10 years later. Well, we welcome the healing, but we demand the change. Right? Because if you don't put that pressure on yourself, uh, you know, you're going to stay right where you're at. And... Um, and that's why people will use terms like, well, God knocked me upside the head when that thing happened, when I got that DUI, when I got that whatever. God didn't do any of that. That was your poor behavior that got you in trouble. <laughs> right? But we'll wait for that, like, aha moment, like, well, I better demand some change now. Why did we wait for the negative to tell us what to do when we can positively make a choice in an area right now? Yep. Amen. Right? So, so we welcome healing but we demand change. The next one is adhere to and rely on his word. The Bible says if you believe, and when you take that word apart, in many sections it means to adhere to, like stick to, to rely on, to trust in. It's a part of you. You're in it and it's in you. You know, it becomes who you are. When we do that with God's word, that's great. Now, here's what happens though is in Christendom, what we do is we'll, we'll see somebody who's hurting. Maybe they're arrested in development. They're in the height of their pain. They haven't de-escalated. They don't even know if they're determined that they want maturity. And we will go, you need to believe this word right here. And we give that to them. And, and they're supposed to go, oh, I didn't know that. I'm just so happy. You know, everything's going to change now. I'll just come over and adhere to it. It doesn't work that way. They have to mature just like a child maturing, just like us maturing in any area where we're immature. We've got to walk through the de-escalate our feelings, identify the fear, pride, and shame. We've got to go through these different things. And that's what prepares our heart to go, okay, I'm going to grab a hold of some word right now, and I'm going to rely on it. I, it's going to stick to me, and I'm going to stick to it, and I'm going to hold on to it. I'm going to grab it. And, um, and, and even at that moment, to begin with, it's not like you go, yes, it has just become life to me. No, you have to grab onto it and hold onto it long enough and recite it and call it and believe it and work it. And the spirit of the living God will drive it home till suddenly you're, not, you're effortless about it. You had all this work up front and suddenly the perseverance like Pastor talked about will cause you to come over where it's just a part of you. It's just like where the scripture talks about the old men and it refers to him and says, who have known him from the beginning. Once you get to a spot in an area where your most mature self is like the old man who is like, ah, God's got this. I've known him from the beginning. Yeah. Right? But you, you can't just pop on over to that spot or you can't live old enough to be in that spot. Well, I've been going to church since I was, you know, for the last 40 years. That doesn't make you mature. That's right. You still have to work the process and there's a perseverance that goes in that. Um, so, any case, we acknowledge the arrestment and we welcome healing but demand change. We adhere to, rely on his word. And then that also, the whole time, the next one is time spent in worship is, um, is increasing all the time. Now, we should be worshiping all the way through this, but it's really hard to worship when you're escalated. And when your arrestment's up, you don't like to worship either. We can pretend, we can do the face. But, um, you know, we have to, if we're in, in the process of interrogating our thoughts or they're pushing us around or whatever, our worship isn't really that hot during that time. So this process of what we're going through, you can do on a daily basis so far even, um, and work that process, go all the way through it in one day. Just, I've worked this process and gone all the way through it in an hour. 
because some emotion came up, some big thing where like, I got to de-escalate. I got to identify fear, pride, and shame. And you just work it. It's a system that you end up working. And, um, and then worship comes out of that. It just comes out of that. Your, your tears, the, the use of the keys are, are many times in that spot. God, show me. Show me the deeper me. Show me how to do this. And, um, and then number 10 says, allow the fire of the spirit to bring change. So uh, I've been praying a lot lately on um, just being open to the Holy Spirit. Now, that's a term that can be a Christian ease that we go, okay, what does that mean, though? What does it mean? Because in the depth of that meaning is where we're going to get freedom. There, there's something about allowing the fire of the Spirit to change us. So a lot of times we'll have um, songs that we'll sing. We're like, send your fire, Lord. Uh, you know, fire, rain. We got all these different terms we're using. And in many times, people who are not familiar, though, they come to church and they're like, I don't even know what we're singing about. We got some fire going on. And they're asking for this to fall on them. And, you know, uh, but the fire of the Spirit is that purifying agent uh, that the purpose Jesus left and sent the Spirit was to get that fire in us and on us. The Spirit of the living God purifies his word, who is Jesus, as he dwells in us through the kingdom and through the spirit, purifies us. Right? That's, that's just common knowledge in Christianity, right? So we're all on the same page. At the same time, though, we don't necessarily um, honor the spirit in a way that we recognize that fire for what it is. Because we've heard it, and we've talked about it. Let the fire fall, let your glory come. These are all terms, right? I mean, think about it. Let your glory come. The glory of God. Like the glo- like burn your face off, blah, you know, glory. Uh, what was, you know, yeah, the, his glory, glory to God. He was here today. The glory was here. Well, yeah, his glory has been poured out on the earth. He's pouring it out even right now. Yeah. When it comes to revival, revival's here. We just haven't seen the manifestation in America like we should. So I think that's really what Bob Jones' prophecy was about, is there's a marking that there's going to be an awakening in America like there hasn't been before, right? And we're going to wait to what's already been outpouring on us. So we have the fire, we have the water, we have these different things. And, um, and here we are uh, trying to get a hold of the fear and get that to dissipate. At the same time, we have all these big, powerful things that we have access to. Yeah. This is also why people are leaving the church. If we got these big, powerful things that we have access to, where's the signs and wonders? Yeah. Yeah. See, we're lulling ourselves to sleep by having a, a standard or a measurement that's way lower so that we can feel good about ourselves because we're afraid that if we don't have that, well, maybe we're not loved by God. We're afraid that maybe he'll pass us by. We're afraid of all kinds of different things. Rather than saying, I'm not leaving here until the healing manifests. Because I believe. Yeah. See what I'm saying? Yeah. I'm not letting go of you until your fire burns this out of my heart. Yeah. Yeah. But we're trained to talk like it's already happened and it's really big. You know, like the fire was here. Oh, the anointing was so strong this morning. Yeah. So the anointing breaks every yoke of bondage. Let's hear some testimonies. Let's pass the mic around. What what broke? What broke this morning? Come on. What broke? What broke? See, this is that Ephesians evangelist (laughs) coming out of me. What broke? See, he breaks every yoke of bondage with this anointing, the same anointing that raised Jesus, the son of the living God, from the dead dwells in me. Where's the power? Where's the power? When we don't have a proper measurement of power and answers and all of those different things, we will project a religion that's based in fear. And so when we stood against that, I believe it was November, it was the first time we prayed against fear, you know, corporately. It's been a while back already, huh? Um, we don't want religion here. No, no. It's here. 
you know, because we can also say, well, we're not that church that's very religious. We don't have, no, it's here. Because fear is here. And wherever fear is, religion lurks around. And we have religious thoughts and religious beliefs and religious ways that we pray. And God is going to change all that up because to manifest revival, we have to be open to him changing us. The fire of the spirit brings such change that it's beyond our normal thinking. We're open to whatever he has for us. And we're believing for more. It's fear that puts that limit. It's an enemy of the cross. It's an enemy to your body. It's an enemy to your mind. It's from the pit of hell. Yeah. What makes heaven heaven is there's no fear. See, when there's no fear, sickness can't manifest. Ever think of that? Fear is what changes the molecular energy in your cells to go to a sick way. No fear, no sickness. No fear, no poverty. It's taking a little bit to set that in, right? But at the same time, we find comfort in our Christianese or we find comfort in projecting something big that has happened um, and it's not as big as what we're saying or what we'd like to think it is. I'm making you think this morning. See, um, remember last week we talked about uh, a brain that's unchallenged quits developing and a brain, a brain that's over-challenged doesn't develop right, but the brain that's supposed to be pushed a little bit, right? A little bit of aggravation, a little bit of <laughs> perseverance has to come out of that. And it causes you to, to come to the end of yourself. And when you come to the end of yourself and, and rely on the spirit, he's going to manifest stuff through you that your creative side will come out and he will make a way through you like you've never seen before. Then you'll first have an aha moment. Amen. I always think about the children of Israel and, and try to compare myself to that, which is hard to do because I wasn't back there. But, you know, just think about the, the cloud and the fire. Like they had the thing, right? If we went outside of church and we always had a big cloud over it or we had the fire burning, you know, people who see it for miles and everything. I mean, to think on our flesh is that fleshly that we get used to that. Like, yeah, it's just God up there. This is a fire. No big deal. Yeah. I mean, they just took things for granted. They just took it like, well, you know. And they were in more unbelief, and they had the sign right there. So we look for the signs and wonders many times so that we will believe. But Jesus is saying, uh, you know, without seeing, we should believe. And when, when you can't see, like Frederica could not see a way out, she created something in that moment. She came to the end of herself and she saw what God wanted her to see when she came to the end of herself. Not interesting. But she couldn't, have, you, you know, she could have, if she had seen the fire, she'd have seen the cloud, you'd, you'd have think, well, yeah, God's right there. You're going to see this manifestation just like the children of Israel. I mean, they were following. They should have stayed on track, but they kept getting off track all the time, and he's there. The sign is right there in front of them. That's how our flesh is that fleshly. That's how, you know, and they lived in fear. But think about how many years were they slaves. So they had slaves' way of thinking. They thought poverty. They thought whoopings. They thought you know, being taken advantage of, they thought overwork, they thought, you know, all of that. And so you, when you come out of that, you'll pendulum swing to, you know, come over here and be like, ah, way over here in your emotions. And then many times you'll come way over back, but God is in the middle and they didn't know how to live there. And they wandered around in the desert, in the dry lands, trying to figure it out when he was trying to get them to the promised land. And he himself was manifesting right there. Now, we don't have the cloud and the fire that we visibly see, but we have the power that's greater. We have the Holy Spirit. And we are in the dispensation and the age of the New Testament. The new will that he has laid out for us says that we're overcomers. Amen. And we have the power, right? So let's go to Acts chapter 1. And um, I preached this before when it came to don't mind me and my dynamite, but when it came uh, to, 
Just letting you know it's not real, right? Um, <clears throat> I've preached this before when it came to preaching on revival, and I just think it's something I'll harp on until I choose to leave this earth. <laughs> and um, in Acts chapter 1, there was steps to get to the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And, um, you know, just starting right out in the chapter, it talked about them uh, re- having things recorded, having things, um, you know, that they had to rehearse. What were the things that God has done? You know, he starts out talking about that. Then, then after that, they go into, without going just detail to detail, you can just bring up, you know, maybe, uh, let's see. Where do I want to go? Yeah, just bring up chapter 1 and the Amplified, and we'll go to verse 6. When they got in verse 6, it literally, they were um, turning to the Lord then, and, you know, they were rehearsing the things he's done to begin with, and then they turn, and, they, and they're like, so is it time to reestablish the kingdom? Like, what are we doing? They started asking questions. Then he goes on uh, a little bit later and says, this is not, actually, it's in verse 7. He says, this is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority. Don't worry about that stuff. He was always getting them to a place because their brains could not just function on just trust, right, just like us. And so they always had that question that would say, well, tell us this or tell us that, when really he was saying, don't worry about that. That's not your thing to know. And then verse 80 says, but you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and the ends of the earth. And so to be a witness is to be a martyr. That's what that word means, is to be a martyr, which means to be seen and heard at all costs, even unto death. Right? right? It's going to take some Holy Ghost power to do that. Yeah. Especially when you're the first ones being launched. Yeah. Think about that. It's not like, who else wants to go on the mission field? Well, people have been going on the mission field for years. This is like, no, you guys are the first ones. I'm leaving. Holy Spirit's going to come. And then you're going to go right here up close and personal, farther out, and to the ends of the earth. You're going to be the ones. You're going to have to lay down your life. It could come to the place of martyrdom, the place of death. Right? And so don't ask me about dates and all those kinds of things. And then he says, after he said this, he was taken, verse 9, he was taken up before their eyes and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, he said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way and you have seen him go into the heavens. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the hill called the Mount of Olives. So the word Olivet we've talked about before Um, or olives, or oliver, means the place of peace. So then they returned to Jerusalem, which was the place where their family members had been killed. All of those different things took place. Remember I said this is the place of, uh, of being martyred for their faith. All kinds of babies were killed there. And, and so he's saying they, they, this is their assignment. They had to go to Jerusalem, the place of their pain, and pass by Mount Olive, which is the place of peace, which is what we do when we're dealing with our pain. I have to go to the place of pain, and I got to visit it, not out of pain. I got to get to a place of de-escalation. I got to get some peace on this, and then I'm going to go into my place of pain and wait for the Holy Ghost to show up. That's what Jerusalem stood for. And so... A Sabbath day's walk from the city. When they arrived, they went upstairs to the room where they were staying. Those present, and it names all the people that were present, they all joined together constantly in prayer along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus and his brothers. I like how they named everybody, you know, because it's really saying these people were united on one thing and they were in a place of prayer. Well, at any time, they could have been martyred just sitting there because they're in the place of Jerusalem, the place of their pain. At the same time, they had to pass by Oliver, all of it, the meaning of, of that is the place of peace, which means nothing's broken, nothing's lacking, nothing's left wanting. In those days, Peter, verse 15, stood up among the believers, a group numbering about 120, and said, Brothers, the scripture has to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke long ago through the mouth of David concerning Judas, who served as a guide. Well, then they weeded out at that time. They still are in this process of 
uh, Judas got weeded out, and so now we, we've got to resolve this, and we've got to bring the next people in. They're still waiting, though. They're waiting for the promised Holy Spirit. We have the promised Holy Spirit. We can go to our place of pain anytime. He's here right now. Well, if he's here right now, then why don't I have the victory? If he's here right now, why am I healed? If he's here right now, see, that's that questioning that causes us to either go into religious belief or absolute fear. And we don't want to think about it, and so we won't go to our place of pain. So going through... I could continue on, but I actually already preached this when it talks about uh, the Holy Spirit coming. Um, when he said you shall re receive power, he was talking about dunamis power. Most full gospel people know dunamis power. Dunamis power is dynamite power. It's the power that's explosive. It's a power that if you have a limit and you set some dynamite power here and you light it with the fire of God, something's going to blow big. That means there is going to be a cause and an effect. Religion just talks about it. Yeah. Right? I just, you know, I just think God's going to do something and he's going to, it's always down the line. It's like, no, I'm actually going to light this sucker right now. See, that's that now faith attitude. So I brought some dynamite to get today. It's, it's fake, but um, just as like, you know, really what's sitting in this congregation is far bigger than the little bit that I have. Because you have dunamis power. You have dunamis power. You have dunamis power. I mean, I could hand you each one of these, and this is just a little bit. The infilling of the Spirit is a pouring out that's a lot. It's more than enough. How do we know? When He fills us, just like Psalms 90, uh, or 23 says, um, our cup runneth over. He's not just a couple little sticks, you know. Hope this makes your lifetime. You have enough of this power to blow away any limit that's in your life. Amen. You have enough of this power. Well, if I have enough of it, what's the problem? Well, the problem is it, dynamite just sits there if there's no fire. This has to be lit. It has to be lit. What, what lights this? Fire? What is the fire? <laughs> right? So what is the fire? See, this is part where we don't understand the glory of God on top of it. You know, when we say, yeah, I just want the glory of God to just rest on this place. We're not understanding what we're saying. Just the same way we're, we're like, we need the fire. The fire will burn out of you any chaff that's in there when you invite the fire. It will also light up, dunamis will light up this, right? That's the power of the Holy Spirit. That's why the baptism of the Holy Spirit is the infilling of increase that lights the dynamite, right? You have a measure of the Spirit when you receive Christ and his kingdom in you. And then when you say, God, you know, I give you my heart and, uh, you know, come and dwell in me. And then he turns and he says, come and dwell in me. Right? Come into my spirit and my spirit into you. It's an absolute exchange. And when that happens, we have to be willing to be convicted. We have to be willing for absolute change. We have to be willing to, for movement because fire never sweeps through something, especially causing uh, uh, an explosion. And we go, yeah, now we just go back to the same thing we've been doing. Sitting in the same spot, talking the same way. That was a good service. Whoo, good service. And the fire ignites one of these puppies, you will never be the same. So the measurement has to change on um, the equaling part of the equation. So two plus two does actually have to equal four. 
And so when we lay our lives against the word, we lay our, our fear against it, knowing whether or not fear is gone or knowing whether or not we're actually operating and actually seeing signs and wonders, and we've actually been lit up on the inside, we have to be able to lay ourselves against the word to know and see that for the reals. Or we will make statements, and or we'll just get used to the fire in the cloud, wander around the desert with the absolute power of God right there, but we'll just wander around. Because you can carry these in droves. I could have a backpack on me. I could have them strapped to my legs. I could have one strapped to my forehead. But if they're not lit, they do nothing. It's the Holy Spirit that lights these. And so when we invite the fire, and I want you to, you know, dig into the word. You got to get hungry and allow that hunger to build. Where you dig in the word and start looking up the word fire. What does that stand for? There's places in the scripture that talk about strange fire in the camp. Sometimes there's strange fire in the camp and we call that God. It's like, that ain't God, that's a strange fire. Right? We have to be able to de decipher the fire of God because he is going to light us up for a reason. And um, a lot of times we'll just kind of flash these, you know, in prayer lines or we'll flash this kind of stuff. And we ourselves are really not lit. Inside, we're really bound, and he's really wanting that to break. Because then you minister out of those limits being taken off of you. Because see, what, what limits this area here, when fear limits you here, it's a dam of your soul. Then your influence factor can't come, come out. What does he say of the word that's in us? It will come out like rivers of living water. Well, unless it's dammed. Unless there's a blocker. Well, how do you get rid of those dams that were put there? Time for some dynamite. Time for some fun. Get some earplugs. Tell the world to go away because we're about to light some things. And I, I think, you know, I'm just really just opening it up just that little bit just to make you curious that we've got to explore these words. If we're going to take out fear, we've got to know what we believe and why. And when we can label something like that was the anointing. So, sometimes I'll even say that was a little bit of the anointing. Someone else who's never seen it will be, oh my goodness, that was the anointing. No, if the oh my goodness kind of anointing would have showed up, this would have happened. Yeah. See, we, our measurements are off. Yeah. But part of that is a fear that somehow we'll get left out or we'll find out in the end everything we've been leaving that wasn't true to begin with. So we got we to we gotta have that. We got to see something. We got to make sure that we claim the little thing. Otherwise, in the end, what if what we're believing is not true? I want to see blind eyes healed. Yeah. Now, because I've experienced cancer, when I pray for uh, people who have it or potentially, I see it. I see it. Because whatever dam was here broke. And when it broke, it was like, I see, I see it on people who don't know they have it. And, it, and there's something, there's rivers of living water coming out of me. And I'm like, Phew, let's just run over that. Let's just run over that. And wherever they're damned, I want to plant something very explosive. But I can't light this on my own. It's a gift to me. I have it. But the one who's going to light it is the Spirit of God. It's the Spirit of God. And we have to honor him. He's the fire lighter. He's the one who moves in that anointing. Let's stand this morning. Jimbrate li sungre, da da singre le la ha shinde de bata. Dumbre siti de kisna, do do boston de le kinamana nanasa. Rate le ko sungre de stan ne krapa suste de dishi. Zatana ko sosondo. Zime petra ki solo hondrati kishita. Create a place for me. Create a place for me. Make a way for me like you've never done before. Make an opening. Move things about. Change things up. Make a bigger opening for me to show up. Put kindling down. Put kindling down and I will light that fire. Yes. 
Bring logs in and I will light the fire even greater. Gather, gather, gather the people and I will light the fire. We started out praying in November against fear. I don't think it's unbelief or an oddity to pray to God and say, I want to see the real you. I want to see the measurement that we talk about. Oh, the glory is so great. I want to see that. We're not mocking him or pushing him. We're holding him to his word, which is what he asks us to do. But if we lower the power of his word and then ask him for that, that's what we'll see. If we take it to where he wants to go, and that's our standard, then it's us that has to come up and crave for that. It's us that has to do it. And it's never God, then, that's put in a spot where he lets us down. He's not a man that he can lie. He's got it. He's got it. He did him a sole. He did him a man and a Praise you. Praise you, Lord Jesus. Praise you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. There's something about the dynamite that if you have it in your pocket and you mark it as something you own, that's one thing. But if you have it out ready to be used and on standby at any time and you're looking to blow something up, where's the limits? Something needs to go. Let's blow something up. Let's get to a place where we're taking out those limits and those dams that have damned us in the areas we need to be free in, that we claim we're free in. I want the real deal. Real people have real success. Real word is real success. I believe. Do you? Do you? Then together this year is going to be eye-opening prophetically for this reason. The church has got, I'm talking about the body of Christ, has got to come up out of all the Christianese talk, all the little flowery things and love and, you know, the things that we are really saying that we think really run deep that are just so shallow. You know, kind of like, I'm praying for you, and we never do. You know, those kind of shallow things that is just in Christianity. He's wanting to, to see that 2020 vision is here up close and far out. Here up close and far out. What's where? And when you see a here up close and far out, you'll also see, are there limits trying to prevent the far out? I need to move from here to there. I can see here, but I can also see there's limits. Let's get some dynamite out. It's time. It's time for prayer meetings in people's homes. This is a year that God is going to, and I'm prophesying right now, he's going to raise up people out of this congregation and draw others to us that will be willing to have prayer meetings in their homes, or they will be travelers of prayer meetings. When there's assignment, it isn't that you're going, I'll pray for you, and I'll call, I I prayed for you, you know, maybe said your two-sentence prayer or whatever. It's like, actually, we're going to go with a group of people and show up at that person's house and pray till we get answers. Pray till we get a release. Pray till something got lit. Right? Till a limit came off and stay on it. He's causing the church to come up to a place where we're going to actually say and then do. Not believe, but it's never happening. See? That means we have to be truthful. This is a year of truthfulness. Truthfulness. Truth without love is not truth at all, and love without uh, truth is not love at all. They have to go together. God is love, and we want him to move, so we have to be truthful. They go together. You shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. God is love. You put those two together. This is the year I think God's bringing us to a point where we put these glasses on and we go, that really is the truth. This is where I really am at. This is what the word really does say. This is what we're really falling short of. This is how many times I never even lit this. I just talked about it. See, it's a measure. Glasses cause measurement. Causes measurement. Causes you to be able to see how far, how close. 
when you're not able to see before. Yeah? This is that year. Here we are. We're in a place where this is going to go off. And we have to be able to house the fact that when something erupts and it blows, like what we prayed for for you this morning, like it's going to take dunamis power to get that to break free, right? So as that happens, that means limits are going to go. That gets messy. Are we willing to be that uncomfortable that we are the it's okay to be messy church? Really? Because, you know, a lot of times we'll say, oh, you know, our church just ministers to this and that. You know, actually, we're just keeping it really quaint and it isn't a big thing that's really happening. Because in Jesus' ministry, <laughs> wherever he went, demons were crying out. People were puking, throwing themselves in the fire. I mean, there was stuff. It got messy because why? Just his power walking through caused things to get lit up cause limits to come off right there's an agitation uh, in fact even uh when he saw the man with legions i mean before he was really saying anything what would you do with me what do you want with me jesus of nazareth that's how i want to be when i when i go places to minister i really want demons crying out and saying oh no it's mary of stanchfield she's here yeah. what do you want mary of stanchfield what you know <laughs> right because why? You, you don't fear anybody who just carries dynamite. You only fear those who know how to light it. Hear that. The devil's not really scared because you're a carrier. But if you understand the fire, which is the glory of God, he's in trouble. We're going to take this region. I'm not big-headed about it. I'm just saying what God says. We're going to take this region. We are going to be right in the heart of leading people to Christ, deliverance and everything, working with all kinds of churches that don't even know it yet. They don't know it yet. They don't know what's about to hit them. But we're coming, and those limits that are there that say, no, we don't work with you, no, we don't do Oh, those are all limits that the Holy Spirit fire will blow up. So there needs to be a lot of explosions And we need to be willing to do this if we're the only church. I don't believe we are, because that would be narcissistic in thinking, right? But it can feel like it sometimes because you might get teased. You know, like, oh, you're those tongue talkers, you're those whatever. Hey, however we get the limits off, if it's working for us, right? Don't knock it if it works. Don't try to fix it if it works. And, and so, um, so let's just put our hands out right now. Hmm. These are hands that will carry dynamite. These are hands that will know when to release it as it's lit. These are hands that will know how to handle it and how to add more at times. These are hands. We receive that right now for this entire congregation, even for those who are at home or listening online. In the name of Jesus. We now put on our 2020 vision. By choice, we choose to come into 2020 vision. We're going to see up front, in the middle, and all the way out. Because a martyr, a witness that is going to minister up here, and then out to Samaria, and out to the ends of the earth, has to be able to see all of those places. So we put on 2020 vision. Right now, in the mighty name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name. You may be seated. I just want to give you a little word picture. It's for somebody. Maybe it's for all of you. I don't know. But if you are... Um, working in a prayer line or you're praying for somebody on the streets or your grandma or your, I don't know, your sister, whoever, you will find when you're operating in dunamis power, it's almost like the word picture of looking for, you know, if you've ever gone through these caves where they use dynamite to blow out to mine, have you ever gone in those? 
they shut the lights all off and you go through all the stuff. Well, we've gone to many of those, just, you know, homeschooling and doing things like that. And they, they showed how they made a hole first in the rock, yeah. right? You got to do the hole first in the rock, in the hard area. That's what God does with us. If there's a dam, you've got to make a hole or several holes. And where are you making it? Not in the soft part. In the hardest supportive area. You find the vein that's like, oh, this is the strong area. We're going to need to make a hole and then just slide the dynamite right in there. Right? And then you back up from it and light that puppy. And just let the chips fall where they may. Then there's a cleanup crew. Right? So when we're praying for somebody, like a saint in prayer line or whatever, sometimes, you'll, you know, God will just give me a word picture like that. But I'll be listening to someone's story as they're talking to me, and I'm thinking, mm, there's the vein right there. If we're going to blow this limit, we're going to have to make a hole right there. He's going to show you that this year. That's a gifting that's coming on this body this year. That you're going to see that, and all of a sudden it'll be like, there it is. Let's just go ahead and slide it right in there. And take our time when we're praying. We're not just shooting up any little prayer. It's dangerous stuff. Right? We're handling dangerous stuff. And there's lives involved. And so we're going to slide this right in there and light it by the glory of God. And when that happens, we can stand back and watch him. And we'll know, yeah, we helped get in there. We helped slide it in. We did all that kind of stuff. But the power is in the dunamis. Yeah. It's not our power. Yep. Amen. Those connections all make, and we'll be able to stand back. And then you stay with the person and help clean up the mess. Help see the light at the end of the tunnel now that we blew this away. Help gather it. That's called spiritual adoption. Amen. We'll continue on talking about this maybe in prayer and some other series um, as we go. But I believe this morning we received the anointing of the 2020. That means you're going to see your life differently, your finances differently, your health differently, your job differently, your purpose differently, your season definitely differently. And he's moving this herd to some mighty things. Amen. Be blessed.